Hello, it's me, Marilia, and I want to welcome you to Salto del Gato's YouTube channel. And of course, this is the Tarot Series playlist. And today we're going to journey through and explore the Hierophant. That's the fifth card of the Major Arcana. And it is a card that can be difficult for some to understand. Uh, it's so complex that I have written myself a whole list of little keywords and notes. So I'm going to be referring to them to make sure that I cover the cards implications as well as I can. So the Hierophant, some people think of it as a coming of age, a graduation, a moving up, up, up leveling. Uh, it could be a celebration. I often associate it with birthdays. Why? Because spiritually, it's kind of the universe renewing our contract for another year, letting us know we matter. We're so important that it can't work without us here. We're needed here, so we're renewed for another year. But more than a rite of passage ceremony like a communion or even a marriage or a bat mitzvah, it's a deeper um, influence. It's something, something that comes in and really influences and makes an impact in your life. So ask yourself that question when you get the Hierophant. What influences you to such a degree that it has either reset your life course or led you in a different direction than you thought you would be going in? For instance, did you join the military? Did you dedicate yourself to things like martial arts or dance or writing? Did you decide to change professions um, and no longer go into law and now you're going to go into medicine? What inspired that? What drove you to make this change? That's where the Hierophant comes in. Is it re religiosity? Yes, it can be. Is it tradition? Yes, it can be. It can be that place in your life where you are confronted with the expectations, the societal expectations from the society you live in or from the family that you come from. So you find yourself in this place where these two opposing forces cause an inner conflict. And your role at the Hierophant is to find the mentoring, find the counseling and the guidance that you need. And sometimes it appears and sometimes you're your best mentor. So walk your own self through your inner conflict and identify the forces that are causing this discomfort and then try to figure out how do you make these work for you? How do you bring them into partnership and cooperation? And how do you find your middle pillar? Because this is a card that's all about that place where we meet our future. What happens here at the Hierophant typically has life-altering implications for you. So it's, it's very important to pay attention to that. And it's very, very important to understand that it is more than just about religion or spirituality or about a celebration. It is about an extremely strong and important influence in your life that coincides with you coming of age at a certain age whatever that is maybe you're a 10 year old who went to a ballet and was totally impressed that is where the Hierophant's influence comes in this larger thing more than you has now impressed upon you and it's laying out a desire to follow a direction it's a place to be very careful because the Hierophant can easily, you can see where it can easily be where you're led into a cult. That's where a reversed Hierophant should be considered carefully. What are you being influenced by that perhaps isn't in your best interest? Or what influence are you dealing with that you're not dealing with very well? It is a place where mentoring definitely comes into your life. And again, like I said, that could be an outside source mentor, and it could be your own self mentoring you. You will know. But the Hierophant is a card that is a much larger expansion in your awareness 
when you came out of your mama and daddy's house, you are now into society. You're living away from home. You're no longer that child. The society now has certain expectations about you. Hierophant is also that time when, you know, an 18-year-old leaves the house and now they're dealing with their choice and their reality of what to do next. And it's very, a very fragile time because they can be easily influenced. And so this is where mentoring comes in. The, the association with the Hierophant with religion comes in there because as you can see, in a community, churches are supposed to provide that type of guidance. Um, obviously it becomes complicated with religion because they also have their doctrines that they try to indoctrinate you to when maybe all you're looking for is someone to talk to and to you know vent to to help you sort out all of your feelings that are happening inside of you that are causing you conflict mentoring is a big part of this card but so is indoctrination so you have to be very careful i hope that this helped clarify for you the concept embodied in the Hierophant. And we're going to now turn it over to Desiree who's going to enhance our lesson a bit more with her beautiful stories. The Hierophant is the creator of hierarchies. He works his magic building institutions out of the hopes and fears of a society. He offers us the illusion of safety in exchange for control over our spirituality. Most of the time, this means severing the roots that we grew with the High Priestess, which connect us to the Great Goddess, or the Empress. When this is done, the Emperor, as we see him now, appears. He isn't the lover of Earth, the provider, protector. Instead, he becomes a warrior god and his passions become much more human. Myths originating from the steppes region where ancient nomadic tribes lived show the Hierophant at work. Manu and Yemo are twins born from the union of the primordial mother and father at the beginning of time. Manu must sacrifice his brother to create order out of chaos, or our world, becoming the first priest. From his brother's body emerge the social classes. From his head spring more priests. From his arms and chest come the warriors, and from his mandits and legs come the commoners. All myths of Indo-European origin have a version of this myth. In Norse myth, Odin kills the giant Ymir and creates our world. And then he creates the first man and woman from two logs, the ash and the elm. Ask and Embla are the first parents and their offspring are commoners, but their grandchildren are farmers and herdsmen and their great-grandchildren are finally nobles. The structure created by the Hierophant and enforced by the king's rule are protected by the warrior class, the three powers working hand in hand to maintain the status quo. But what happens when the social order is upset? and the rules are broken. The Hierophant's influence is at the heart of many epic mythological battles, whether it's between the Irish Tuid the Danann and the Fomorians, the Norse Vanir and the Asir, the Hindu Asura and the Devas. These stories give us insight into how outside influences affect the social order of a culture. The outcome depends on the influence of the Hierophant. In Norse mythology's first war, the Hierophant's power over the Asir caused their warrior god Odin to take drastic measures when a goddess from another realm becomes too influential. The Asir and Vanir are from two different worlds, Asgard and Vanaheim. Odin, Asgard's leader, created another realm called Midgard by slaying the giant Ymir and using his body to shape the earthly realm of humans. The Asir were warrior gods of great wealth and power. Asgard was built of gold and silver supplied by dark elves, and their warriors were the fiercest 
in all nine realms. The veneer come from the sea god Njord. His children are Freya, the goddess of love and prayer, who brings the soft winds and rains which nourish the lands of Midgard. The children of Njord ensured the fertility of Midgard's land, causing the dismembered giant Ymir's beard to grow as luscious grass and his hair as the dense dark forest. Freya was often sad. She was married to a wanderer who was always off exploring new worlds, and she missed him terribly. Sometimes she would use her magic to shapeshift into a falcon or mount her chariot drawn by her beloved cats and set off to try to find him. But one time she set off for an adventure of her own. Like everyone else in the Nine Realms, Freya admired Asgard's wealth. She saw all the beautiful gold and the power it seemed to bestow on the gods who possessed it, and she wanted some for herself. After all, Asgard had plenty of it. Their whole world was made of it. She decided she would go to Asgard and earn some of that gold for herself. And it was easier than she thought it would be. Though the Aesir were great warriors and smiths, they did not practice the powerful nature magic that the Veneers knew, and they especially did not know the ways of the potent love magic Freya could wield. She shared her magic with all who asked, for a price, of course. The Aesir could not get enough. It wasn't just the magic she worked on their behalf, but it was her, too. She was absolutely irresistible. Her warmth and beauty were impossible to deny. Odin didn't like this. He saw her as a gold digger. He began to call her Golvig or Goldlust, and he devised a way to rid Asgard of her powerful magic. Burn the witch, was his command. And he tried to, not once not twice, but three times. Each time she was unharmed by the flames. Not a single strand of her golden hair was singed. Before long, Vanaheim had received word of what Asgard had done to Freya, and they were preparing for retaliation. They evaded Hemdall, breached the golden towering walls of Asgard, and marched to the field of Ida, where they were met with Odin's spear. The battle was on. The Aesir warriors were formidable, but the powerful magic of the Vanir matched their skill and strength blow for blow. Odin's warriors were relentless, and Freya's powers leveled the great walls of Asgard. Eventually, after many battles with neither side gaining any ground over the other, both sides agreed to a truce. Both sides agreed to pay tribute to the other in the form of their most valuable gods. Freya agreed to go with her brother and father to Asgard. She would teach Odin her magic. Odin gave the Vanir his two best men. Mimir, who was actually from the realm of the menacing ice giants, Jutunheim. He ruled over the well of knowledge found at the end of one of the roots of Yggdrasil, the world tree. You could ask Mimir anything, and he would have the right answer. Long ago, Odin had traded his eye for the knowledge held in that well. So Mimir also had the gift of being all-seeing, just like the wind. And then there was Hynir, a very strong and brave warrior, and Odin's brother. And he loved him very much, but he had to admit he was a bit of a dingbat. So when the Vanir make Hynir their war chief and quickly realize he cannot make decisions or do anything without Mimir, they feel cheated. They are so pissed that they want to kill Hynir but they know that that would ignite another war. So instead, they behead Mimir and send his severed head to Odin. Now, Odin had sacrificed his eye from Mimir's knowledge, and although he wasn't his kin, he cared for him like a brother. 
He was desperate to keep him alive and useful. Luckily for him, he had Freya. And even luckier for him, she did not hold a grudge, even after he attempted to burn her three times to death. She taught Odin what to do to keep the head alive, and with her help, they stuffed the head with potent magical herbs and recited an incantation. Not only did the head reanimate, but Mimir still possessed his powers, and forever after acted as Odin's counsel. For the Vanir, well, they did eventually get over their anger towards the Asir, and eventually all of the gods from both of the realms agreed to a peace treaty, which they symbolized by spitting in a vat, and eventually that vat becomes the mead of poetry. But that is a story for another time, another archetype, and a different tarot card. So what did you think of that story? I thought, first of all, it, uh, to be honest with you, it, it confused me a little bit. And then it intrigued me because I want to know what the magic is. What's the magic seed? What's that oh, all about? Seed but before we get there. Mm -hmm. So the reason that I, it kind of uh, confused me a little bit was because in the Hierophant, from the tradition that I come from understanding what the Hierophant is, it's a place where we arrive at in our life journey. Now, we understand that all of this is a cycle. The tarot is a cycle, life is a cycle, and that means that we're going to be cycling through these lessons more than once. But when you arrive at the Hierophant, traditionally you are at a rite of passage. That means that you are entering something, some new phase of your life, either because you have grown to a certain uh, age, or because you have graduated into a certain stage. So it's entering into society, if you will. So, right, so the only way that I could, and I, I just, I liked this because I think of the Hierophant as society's role in our life. And so, as you were saying, it, you could think of it sort of an aspect of the Hierophant is entering society. You're no longer just concerned with mommy, daddy, family. Right. We are now... Or even school, even in, in, on any of that. Right. You know, that was part of that was part of the emperor. When we entered, we expanded out of our home into society. We joined groups, we were in school, right. we were playing sports. That all came under the auspices of the emperor. But now... Now this is a, like a like an adult society so adulting you're adulting now yeah we're off to college now. Uh -huh. we're living in a dorm we're out of our home so for freya in the story and odin because we just discussed how you know really um they're both entering into this kind of new society right well freya is so freya is from vanaheim so she's from a different realm. So if anyone's seen the Marvel movies, they talk a lot about Asgard. You'll know that you have to walk on a bridge that's rainbow, a rainbow bridge, which is called Bifrost, in order to get to Asgard. And Heimdall is going to be there at the gate, and he's either going to let you in or he's not going to let you in. Well, you were, and you don't think about it, the rainbow bridge, because mm -hmm. I believe everything has some significance, 100%. some little message. The rainbow bridge. Well, what do rainbows represent? Your wishes, your, you know, pot, pot of gold is at the end of the rainbow. So if you're walking over that bridge, it would be uh, expected that you're going to get to that pot of gold. And that is exactly what Freya wanted. So she's over here. She's So when we think of Vanheim and Asgard, I like to think of it this way. Asgard is very much a warrior society um they are going to be great metal workers um their whole entire city is built of gold and silver so and they're their odin's hall is covered his roof is covered in his shingles the shingles of his roof are all of the shields of all of the warriors that died in battle so there's a lot of um sort of war centered sort of that indo-european um tribal kind of culture going on there. Vanaheim on the very, other hand. Very, 
astrologically Martian influence there. Mars, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yes, God of War, 100%. Uh, Odin is very much a war chief. I mean, that's really the heart of yeah. what he is. So we have a very and Martian influence. Very different there. from the Dagda, which is in our emperor. And I really wanted to make that distinction because we yes. have Odin and, and, and the Dagda are two very different gods. And Odin is a war chief. And Vanaheim, you can kind of look at it like um, the old gods, the old way, the very much animistic way of believing that everything is... This is Odin. Kind of, this is Vanaheim, Vanaheim. which is where Freya that's, comes that's, from, uh -huh. right? So Freya and her and her people, Njord, the sea god, these are all nature deities. So, you know, knowing that Freya is a goddess of love and her brother of fertility and her father of the sea kind of gives you a clue as to, you know, these are peaceful Definitely sort of two different nature. elements. Right. So <laughs> when Freya decides she would like some of that gold at the end of the rainbow, that's her going into an unfamiliar society and kind of saying, I'm going to be ambitious and I'm going to go for this. Gosh, isn't that something? So that, yeah. that's the arriving at that. Mm -hmm. That's that m maturity. Is it good or is it bad? That's, you know, a personal judgment, I think, because she evolves out of this wonderful environment of, of being very nature-based, being in a very fertile environment, and then she's enticed by this, this dream of a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow and she decides she's going to cross over and when she does she becomes aware of, of a new kind of world That's a new nice. kind of living yeah she's um, powerful there's, she's... there's capitalism yeah <laughs> oh, wait. yeah you know what this, mm -hmm. this I can make as much money as I as I can make and she wants it and that's a place of arrival, isn't it? That's kind of Definitely. us, you know, when we were children and we said, oh, we just want to grow up and, and be whatever we wanted to be. It was usually very fairy uh, tale based. Now, it's very um, Saturnian, if you will. It's very concrete. It's very monetized. Mm -hmm. That's what we see. Oh, we, I want that. Right? You have to have the money in this world, right? I mean, if you lived in America, <laughs> you have to understand capitalistic principles. And I think that this story is a good example of a, a goddess who says, well, hey, i got something to give and to share, and I don't want to just, you know, go on living the way that I've, the stat, you know, go on with the status quo. I want to reach for something more. I want that gold over in Asgard. And she does well. She does so well that she pisses off Odin because she's doing so well getting all that gold and Odin doesn't like it so not to confuse our audience <clears throat> who says wait what are y'all talking about <laughs> you're talking about business and capitalism mm -hmm. and this is the Hierophant this is a religious leader isn't he mm -hmm. well do you know of any religion that isn't based in some form of capitalism I don't know. The Vatican comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Jewish synagogues come to mind. Any church. <laughs> the Mormons come to mind. Yeah. I mean, just about every religion is very monetized. Of course. And so that, I think, is part of the message that we get here, that we come with all of these dreams and ideas to walk over that rainbow and get our own pot of gold, and then we encounter the reality, the business of God, the business of religion, mm -hmm. the business aspect of it. And, and it, it ex actually can throw us into a personal crisis, if you will, because all of a sudden, everything we thought about religion or God or being holy has, is totally different. Now it's all about concrete buildings and gold and jewels. So what do we what, what exactly does the Hierophant stand for so for me the Hierophant stands for the clash of those two worlds where you do come and any illusions that you had you have to come to terms with and you usually can't do that alone so in this process there's an inner struggle there's an inner conflict and usually a mentor appears where is the mentor here okay so good point so at first, Odin is very upset with Freya 
and he decides he has to destroy her. Okay, he has to burn the witch. And he burns her three times, but she's a goddess. And now, she's why very does he powerful. want to burn her? Because she went in there and did what? She took his. Go- she took too much gold. She was just being too successful. <laughs> it's entering society. But you know that doesn't stop her. She is not burnt. She is not destroyed. And Vanaheim, the the gods in Vanaheim, her father, the sea god Njord, and her brother Frey, decide that they must avenge her. And Again, I want to stress that if you've heard this story before, and it's not Freya, it's a Gulvig. Gulvig literally translates to gold lust. Most people relate that that is actually Freya going in there teaching the magic. And the reason why is because we know that Freya has a certain kind of magic that I'm going to mispronounce, but it's called Seedir. Um, This kind of magic... Almost like a seer. Yes, and she is a seer. It's exactly what it is. I mean, it sounds like it. It is what it is. And whatever the magic is that she's doing in there is not something that they're used to. So this is something completely new. Odin is very resistant at first. But now we can actually see his path and his uh, the influence the Hierophant has on him. Because when he cannot defeat her, and then they go to battle, and the two forces are too similar vanaheim and asgard although they are different they are equally powerful and they can't win against each other so they come to a truce and the truth the truth is you give me some of your best men and i'll give you some of my best men and they end up with freya and freya then in turn teaches odin her magic and um, and earlier when you were talking about uh, the Hierophant and what the actual influence is, we probably, you know, I probably jumped a little too far ahead because I do mention in the beginning of the story that this um, particular myth tracks with a lot of Indo-European myth. This includes uh, the Greco-Roman um, uh, mythologies, um, Vedic mythologies, all of these stem from Indo-European um, kind of myth, and that myth really does a great job of explaining the Hierophant's role. Because what the myth is is that there's always two brothers. I believe in in the Vedic tradition, it's Manu and Yama, and one of them must be sacrificed. Manu sacrifices his brother Yama, and his body becomes that case system that they have. The head or the priestly case, the, uh, I believe it's the uh, the upper body is the warrior case. Each part of him, and then it's like his genitals and his, his legs are the like, you know, the commoners. Yeah. It's like a, um, it's like a man entering the priesthood or a, a woman entering uh, mm-hmm. the nunnery. They give up all of their life their to body. sacrifice, sacrifice their body. Exactly. it for this higher cause. Mm-hmm. So the Hierophant does, um, it, it begins does to put things in order, that. right? Yeah. Uh, right, it does represent that. For me, um, there's, a common, there's a common story here uh, that I think was really, really evident for me in the High Priestess where you had two opposing forces Mm-hmm. And, you know, if you battle, you're not going to get anywhere. Mm-hmm. So the whole lesson from back in the High Priestess, which was the third trump card, mm-hmm. Fool, Magician, High Priestess, you are working in trying to wrap your head around the fact that, wait a minute, there's two forces here. If I'm on one side or the other, I'm not going to go gonna anywhere. Yeah. So my whole thing is that I have to learn how to bring these two forces together and find the middle pillar. 100%. Yeah. And so here at the Hierophant, we're at the same thing again. Yeah. Because the Hierophant, I, I think that the, the Hierophant, I mean, most traditional tarot readers will say, oh, you got the Hierophant. It means you're going to attend a wedding or a baptism or you're going to go to a church or you're going to have to make a decision and it's up to you whether you're going to do it tradition, the traditional way or you're going to do it the non-traditional way and since the Hierophant is here it tells you to be traditional about it but the Hierophant for me speaks about two whole different realms the realm of spirituality and religiosity 
and the realm of society mm-hmm. and business mm-hmm. and how do you bring those two together yes yeah and that's what i think that mythology did uh, that story did it really really well as it shows hey yeah you guys can fight all day long but it ain't gonna work the only solution was for him to bring freya over to asgard along with her brother and along with Niord. asgard ends up the victors right because i mean look they get the goddess of love and her brother the god of fertility and Niord, who will give all of the you know gods of asgard the fair winds to sail from uh meanwhile on the veneer side <laughs> they kind of feel shafted because they end up getting a very strong great warrior sure but he's that doesn't really have much up here and so they give him Mimir as well. And if you look back at what Mimir is and what Ymir was, who is that giant. So, like I'm saying, the Indo-European myth has two brothers. One of them sacrifices them himself and uh, or is sacrificed by the brother. His body is what makes up all the order of society. Mm-hmm. Okay? Well, in the Norse myth, that giant, and it's always a giant, right? And it's almost like that idea of ordering chaos. That's what the Hierophant mm-hmm. does, right? Pr- trying to put everything in order. And um, Ymir is the giant in Norse mythology. And Ymir is killed by Odin, and his body is used to make all of Midgard, which is Earth. Yeah, that's It's bringing really order out of chaos. Mm-hmm. And so, so let's revisit the Hierophant. I've done tarot reading. I threw out several cards. One of them is the Hierophant. When we get to the Hierophant, how do we interpret that card for the client? What do we tell them? Oh, you're going to go to church? Oh, oh someone's going to appear in your life that's going to mentor you? You're going to join a cult. <laughs> oh, you're going to join a cult. That could happen. Or are we going to explain to them, the card is talking about tradition, but not necessarily tradition in the way that you used to do things, but that you are going to experience being influenced or entering or being submerged in a tradition that has been existing and it is up to you to find your way through that tradition to make it work for you. Mm -hmm. This takes me back to Bridget. Bridget. Yes. 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 Exactly. That's what she did. She didn't resist the Christians coming in. Um, She said, I get it. This is things are cha- times are a changing and let me see how can I carve a space for myself in this brand new world this new brave brave new world this new society same thing I think is happening here with Freya hey you know this li- this world that I live in is great Vanaheim is great but I have something here that I can do something with and I want to use my powers to get some of that gold and you know in the stories Freya is looked at as this evil witch, you know, really evil witch. But when you look at it, what is she doing? What is she doing? Going over there and giving people some love magic, telling them their futures, maybe even letting, helping them figure out a way to steer, you know, their course in life. What is so bad about that? She is securing <laughs> some gain, financial, material mm-hmm. gain for herself. Mm-hmm. And women are always tend to be looked at as a wicked witch when that seems to be something that they make a goal in their life and there's not a damn thing wrong with that mm-hmm. but the tar- but my whole message here is that the Hierophant I, can, I want you to consider looking at it a different way when you now see the Hierophant don't just look at it like a yeah. confusion card oh my god what does that mean mm-hmm. oh it's the Pope what the hell <laughs> I mean, you know right. what does that mean I'm going to go to church. I don't want to go to church. What does it mean? It means something much bigger. It means a time or an experience that you are going to encounter in your life, personally, that's going to release all these different variables that maybe were never part of your reality up until then. And you're going to want some of that. And you might encounter some resistance to you obtaining some of that. And if you give up, then you have an upside down Hierophant. If you battle it and shun it and walk away from it, then you have an upside down Hierophant. It's reversed. But if you see it for what it is and understand how do I find 
the middle pillar in this situation? How do I position myself and my interests so that it's a win-win situation for them and for me? They want something, I want something. How do we mutually come together to get what we